and then we'll do difference between poisonous and non-poisonous snakes followed by difference between the different varieties of poisonous snakes and then we'll see uh, the different properties of snake venom and then we'll come to snake poisoning or snake bite which will include the sign and symptoms investigations and treatment and finally the medical legal importance of snake bite. So the classification of uh, snakes is that snakes are either poisonous or non-poisonous and we are concerned with the poisonous types here. So there are three uh, broad families of poisonous snakes including elapidae, vipridae and uh, hydrophidae and elapids include cobra crate, I've written the examples over here. Cobra and crate are the commonly uh, uh, occurring ones. Uh, also the um, the vipridae family or the vipers include rattlesnake, pit vipers and russell vipers and uh, rattlesnake and pit vipers are uh, the ones that are commonly occurring in our setup. Uh, hydrophidae are sea snakes as the name hydro suggests and uh, we'll also see these. Uh, now the importance of doing the fa different families is that the, uh, there are certain variations of sign and symptoms that we'll see later on. So how do you differentiate poisonous from non-poisonous snakes? Well, there are certain uh, bodily features that can help you identify. Poisonous uh, snakes, for example, have belly scales that are large and they cover the entire breadth of the belly, whereas non-poisonous snakes have belly scales that are uh, smaller and do not cover the entire breadth of the uh, belly. Also, the poisonous snakes have small head scales, whereas the head scales in case of non-poisonous snakes are larger. You may find a pit in between the nostrils and the eyelid in uh, some poisonous snake species, especially the pit vipers, which is absent in non-poisonous snakes. There is another important feature that is the labial folds or the, uh, the scales present on the lips. The third scale present on the lip of poisonous snake extends to the nostril and the eyelid. It touches both the nostril and the eyelid. I've got a picture to show you later. Uh, uh, and this is not the case in ca uh, in poison non-poisonous snakes. Also, the central low uh, of scales on the back is enlarged, uh, whereas it is not enlarged in cases of uh, non-poisonous snake. And also another fold, uh, the labial fold on the under surface of jaw. Now, what I mean by that is that these are the labial folds or the scales present on the lips or the uh, uh, mouth of the snake and you see this uh, fourth intralabial fold or on the under surface of the mouth you count from here and you see this is the largest one fourth one one two three four so this is the largest one this is one characteristic feature of poisonous snake another is that the third intralabial uh, the third labial fold starting from here one two three it touches the nostril and the eyelids in cases of poisonous snake whereas this doesn't occur in cases of non-poisonous snake and also the head scales are small in cases of non-poisonous uh, snake whereas the head scales are large in case of non-poisonous snake this is the central row of belly scales that we are talking about this is again a feature of uh, the poisonous uh, snake so this is a pit that you see in some uh, poisonous species and uh, this is the third labial touching the nostril and the eye. This picture is also given I think in your book and this is the fourth intralabial which is the largest uh, scale on the under surface of the mouth. Now the poisonous snakes have a very typical feature which is the fangs which are large canalized grooves, specialized teeth which can store the, uh, the poison whereas in non-poisonous snake, you don't see any signs. There are only row of teeth present in the uh, mouth. And uh, these are short, solid uh, teeth or fangs, not these long, canalized ones. Also, the salivary pouches are attached to, uh, the fangs are attached to saliva, salivary pouches that are visible, whereas in this case, you won't see any salivary pouches. So, this is also a difference between the two. So, you see two large, hollow uh, fangs. Uh, also you see a pit uh, most commonly in vipers the pupil is slit like or elliptical you see small head scales whereas in non poisonous you see a rounded pupil large head scales the fangs are all evenly uh, sized and uh, the tongue uh, in, in non poisonous and poisonous snakes has nothing to do with 
a poison so it is harmless it is actually the fangs that causes the poisoning uh, another difference is the tail of poisonous snake which is compressed as compared to non poisonous which is uh, not as much compressed also the poisonous snake mostly have nocturnal habit uh, the uh, another feature is that the anal plate uh, the the scales followed uh, fall uh, that follow the anal plate in cases of poisonous snake are present in single row whereas in cases of non poisonous snake you see a double row of uh, scales so Uh, the bite site in case of poisonous snake will show two prominent fang marks you see you may see some uh, minor other teeth marks but in cases of non poisonous snake they they won't be two poisonous fang marks of the uh, of these poison containing grooves uh, or a uh, fang you'll only see a row of uh, teeth marks so this is also the difference between the bite So now we come to differentiating different varieties of poisonous snake. So we, as we saw, the two uh, the uh, the families of uh, poisonous snakes include uh, elapids, vipers, and sea snakes or hydrophyte. So we are basically more concerned with the elapids and vipers. And in these two families, cobras from the elapids are more commonly occurring, and vipers may we will do the uh, the general viper viper family. So we'll differentiate the vipers and the cobras. so the cobra has a smaller head and uh, it is covered by large uh, scales the viper has a larger triangular head and it is uh, actually broader than the body and it has smaller scales the body of cobra is long and cylindrical usually 3 to 4 meters in length viper has short body and its neck is narrower compared to its body and head so uh the vipers measure approximately 1 to 2 meters the pupils of cobra are circular or round and the vipers have slit like vertical pupils the maxillary bone of cobra contains poisonous fangs and there are other teeth present whereas viper has only two poisonous fangs present no other teeth present and the fangs of cobra are short uh they are grooved and short whereas viper has long canalized uh fangs just like hypodermic needles the cobra uh, the poison injected by cobra is the poison of cobra snake is uh, more neurotoxic it produces symptoms of neurotoxicity it in, uh, it affects the nerves whereas in cases of vipers the poison is hematoxic the tail of cobra is less tapering or round and viper has a uh, markedly tapered uh, tail the reproduction in cobra is by uh, eggs whereas in viper it is by laying offspring or giving birth to offspring and uh, this is a picture of a typical cobra and you see this typical mark on the fangs of cobra so this is a cobra this is another picture of cobra so these belong to the elapids whereas this is a viper which belongs to the viper family this is uh, the uh, a very remarkable feature of the viper snake especially the russell and pitt vipers is the presence of these diamond like uh, marks on the body and you see the triangular large head a constricted neck and then this this uh, uh, markedly tapered tail and uh, in cases of cobra you see the, uh, this only occurs in certain cases when the cobra is, has uh, opened its uh, uh, this uh, fang whereas in most of the cases you see uh, that the body is very long and the tail is not as markedly tapered as compared to uh, vipers this is again a viper you see this diamond like uh, prints on vipers only and you see this presence of pit on vipers also so this is a pit viper you see this pit this is a viper snake again pictures of cobra normally the cobras are like these this is only when they are in the attacking mode that they open their uh, these uh, i think they are called fangs and you see a long snake and the head is com uh, comparatively uh, you know the same size of as the body whereas in vipers you see a triangular head which is broader as compared to the body and this is a crate when whenever you see bands on the body of a snake you, you uh, it is a crate uh, more commonly so the, this is a viper uh, this is the cobras these are the vipers and the third one is the crate which belongs to the same family as cobras this is a branded crate 
this is a coral snake and this is a sea snake sea snakes have uh, uh, small bodies not as long as the cobras uh, this is again a viper you see this typical print on the body of vipers and this is a horned viper it has some horn like structures on its head and you see the uh, large triangular head as compared to the body so these are some of the features that will help you in identifying the snake we now come to the second part that is ophitoxemia ophitoxemia is the other word for snake bite and uh, there are three types of snake venom uh, depending on the families that we did already elaporate venom is mainly neurotoxic viper produce a vesculotoxic uh, venom whereas sea snakes have a predominantly myotoxic venom so uh, what is the function of venom the uh, the uh, venom is basically aimed to immobilize the prey and assist in its digestion and when it is fresh it is uh, a clear fluid transparent amber colored when it is dried it forms granular masses which are yellow colored and these can remain active for years so they they can con uh, co uh, cause toxicity when taken orally or otherwise so they can still be potent the venom is composed of a wide array of uh, proteins or enzymes and these are the the commonly occurring occurring one that i have listed here so you see these are basically aimed at digestion or immobilization of the prey so you have fibrinolysins you have proteolysins which are digestive prop uh, which has digestive properties neurotoxins or cholinesterase enzyme that we also did in organophosphate poisoning is predominantly present in elapid uh, snake uh, venom hemolysins and thromboplastin is is present in viper snake venom uh there are other uh, toxins that i've listed some are to uh, hasten or to speed up the spread of venom throughout the body for example coagulase and higher uh, hyaluronidase that break up the uh, cell barriers also phospholipase or uh, those that degrade the lipids and membrane so that the spread of venom can be uh, can be quick can occur quickly throughout the prey now the uh, i i'm not going to go into the pathophysiology we'll just come to the signs and symptoms of uh, snake poisoning so again depending on the family the symptoms are different since we saw that the properties of venom are different so there the, we'll do the local symptoms first that occur at the site of bite and then we'll do the uh, systemic symptoms so for elapid the local symptoms are uh, swelling and small reddish weal that develops at the site of bite uh and also this area becomes very painful and tender and there's a burning sensation for vipers the area has severe uh pain and swelling and there's blistering of the skin of the uh, because of the oozing of hemolytic blood into the skin so you see blister formation so there will be serous blister or serosanguineous blisters and also there will be uh so uh, you see swelling in both cases but in ca when you see blistering it is more typical of viper snake now we come to the general symptoms the general symptoms are classified based on the type of venom they can be neurological symptoms they can be hematological symptoms or they can be uh, myotoxic or muscle related symptoms so we'll do the neurological symptoms first i've listed the symptoms here and uh, they, they can be paralysis the person will not be able to move his jaw or tongue and the the eyelids will droop down there will be ptosis the person will not be able to swallow his so uh, saliva will come out the muscles of uh, speech will be uh, also paralyzed the person will have ultimately difficulty in respiration because the respiratory muscles will be involved the hematological symptoms are uh, marked by spontaneous bleeding from gums from different body orifices including hematemesis hemoptysis hematuria there will be persistent bleeding from the bite side and there may be uh, severe muscle pain dark colored urine and scanty urine, urine volume this is when the uh, there is uh, the involvement of kidneys because of the severe bleeding and the person may collapse in myotoxic uh, uh, snake bite the early symptoms include headache and a feeling of uh, thickness of tongue and severe uh, thirst and then the body undergoes generalized rhabdomyolysis and this is more marked in the proximal muscles 
in the neck and trunk and there, there's severe tender feeling and there's pain on active or passive movement of the body and then the person becomes paralyzed you see uh, myoglobinuria within 3 hours after the bite of a musculotoxic snake so uh, we can also differentiate the symptoms uh, the uh, systematic symptoms based on the snake uh, the two most common families that is elapidi and viperidae so in elapidi you will see nausea vomiting and salivation whereas in viperidae you will see nausea and vomiting but saliva won't come out the uh, the eyelids will be uh, Uh, drop down there will be ptosis pupil be normal and reactive to light in viperidae you won't see any ptosis the head will be drooped and uh, you also may see drooping of the lower lip in cases of uh, elapids since these are neurotoxic uh, uh, snakes whereas in viperidae you see uh, swelling of the parotid gland bilaterally uh, and this is a typical feature of uh, viper bite this is also known as viper head the there will be conjunctival edema and some subconjunctival hemorrhages so these are more vasculotoxic features in cases of viper family also there will be more uh, localized localized swelling of the lymph nodes uh, and whereas in cases of elapids or cobra family you will see more symptoms of neurotoxicity muscle involvement so this is uh, these are pictures of patient of viper bite and you see the oozing of fluid into the uh, eyelids because of the capillary leak because of the vasculotoxic venom and you also see this parotid swelling and this picture has more marked parotid swelling so this this is a case of uh, these are cases of viper bite whereas in this case you see ptosis you see uh, uh, the jaw is uh, you know it's drooped down so this is a case of neurotoxic venom or cobra bite so there will be generalized weakness and muscle paralysis and the person because of these muscle weaknesses will not be able to walk properly there will be staggering gait of that person in cases of uh, cobra bite or elapid bite whereas in cases of uh, viper bite the person will not have muscle weaknesses but uh, he may collapse and therefore he will uh, you might find that a person is brought to the hospital on a uh, by other people but that is not because of muscle weaknesses that is because of the circulatory collapse that he uh, uh, of the vasculotoxic venom the externally you won't find much bleeding at the bite side or from the body orifices in cases of cobra or elapid bites whereas there will be bleeding from mouth nose rectum urethra and at the site of bite in cases of viper bite you won't find any particular hemorrhages under the skin in cases of cobra or elapid bite whereas you see these in viper bite uh, the person who is bitten by a cobra or uh, a snake from the elapid family remains conscious till the end and especially uh, typical to cobra bite are convulsions that can occur which do not occur in crates which are also uh, which also belong to the same family but in cases of uh, viper bite you see that the person because he is going under uh, he develops a shock rapidly because of the vasculotoxicity he may become unconscious and uh, you see tongue swelling in neurotoxic bite you will also see in involuntary uh, urination and defecation which we won't be present in uh, viper bite and then the respiratory muscles get involved in cases of uh, elapid bite because of the paralysis of respiratory muscles and they will be dead due to respiratory failure whereas in cases of viper bite there will be circulatory collapse and dead due to cardiac failure so uh, okay we come to the fatal dose and fatal period i've listed the doses of different snakes and these are for the dry, dried form of venom because obviously you don't know how much venom a snake has injected to cause death of the person once it is in, injected you cannot measure the amount of venom so this this is for the dried form of uh, venom also on an average a russell viper injects a pro, uh, approximately 60 mg of venom and uh, Uh, the range can be from 5 to 150 mg injected by one snake at a time so it depends on the uh, the the time of bite uh maybe you see later on why the time of bite is important it also depends on the clothing on that part of the body uh so the some of the venom may, may not get injected but on an average uh, uh, the amount of venom is 5 to 150 mg
so the fatal period can be variable if the person uh, develops neurogenic shock because of fear the person might may die immediately even if in cases of non poisonous snake bite uh, so they can be immediate death or in case of cobra it can be half to 24 hours and in case of viper bite it can be 1 to 4 days so uh, this is why the timing of snake bite is important uh because there are two types of snake bite one is business bite and the other is defense bite business bite is when the snake means business when he is uh when it is looking for prey it would uh, it would inject large amount of uh, venom and this can cause rapid death whereas in case of defense bite the the snake is not in its hunting mode and uh, the snake is only trying to you know defend itself and uh, just to escape so it won't inject as much venom as in cases of business bite and business bite occur when it's time for hunting so usually no uh, snakes uh, poisonous snakes are nocturnal so these would more be at the time of uh, at the night uh, so how do you diagnose a case of snake bite how do you approach to the diagnosis the most important thing is history where it occurred how it occurred what was the time the bite marks of uh, what were the symptoms that the patient developed especially the non specific symptoms you see uh if the patient is developing headache nausea vomiting abdominal pain chances are that the person is developing systemic signs of toxicity and he's bitten by a uh poisonous snake you can also uh, order investigations that i've listed here um especially these that are related to uh vesicular toxic or viper bite that is ct bt and uh, uh fibronigen d dimer these you can advise so you will see deranged bleeding time and clotting time the the also the test would show that the hemoglobin level and hematocrit is decreased especially for vesicular toxic snake there will be uh, thrombocytopenia there's then 2 lakh per millimeter cube of platelets there will be hematuria on urine analysis the snake has uh, uh, the mouth of the snake has gram negative bacteria therefore there the person may develop leukocytosis because of uh, infection there will be pulmonary edema and or embolization on chest x ray and ecg you don't normally do but if you advise because the patient is uh, above the age of 40 or because there's severe envenomation then you see uh, ectopic heartbeat or tachycardia you'll see prolonged bt and aptt as we saw and if there's not uh, a lab is not uh, you know uh, there's no lab facility nearby you you there's this bedside test that was given in books in which whole blood uh, clotting time is estimated by taking 5 to 10 ml of venous blood in a glass test tube and it is allowed to rest on the bed, uh, side and uh, then you see in how much uh, you know how much time it takes for the clot to develop so if it is taking more than uh, 12 minutes then there is suspicion of coagulopathy that is the person is bitten by a poisonous snake and if it is mo taking more than 20 minutes then this uh, chances are that the person is uh, uh, this is a case of severe envenomation and severe coagulopathy so these were the lab tests that you can do but the diagnosis is based on the the entire picture including the history the symptoms of the patient and then the lab test also help in establishing the diagnosis so once you've diagnosed you will treat the patient now there are basically four principles of treating a case of snake bite number the most important thing the most important initial step is allaying the anxiety and fear as we discussed earlier that patient can die because of neurogenic shock even in cases of non poisonous snake because the person is so scared so you need to allay anxiety and fear then you need to prevent further spread of venom especially in cases when the patient uh, is away from a healthcare facility so you need to uh, make sure that the, there is no further spread of venom you use the typical treatment which is use of anti venom and other anti toxins and there are general measures that we will see later on so allaying anxiety and fear is important because uh, you, uh, you know pe people can die of fear even in non poisonous snake bites and if you reassure the patient you tell them that not all snakes are poisonous even if they are poisonous they can be dry bites uh, dry bites mean that the snake has injected very little or no venom 
and uh, even uh, if fate um, if they are poisonous they the chances are the snake was not fully charged i mean this can be a defense bite or they can be uh, a very little uh, venom injected by the snake in a single bite as we saw it, it ranges from 5 to 150 uh, so there are chances that the snake has not injected enough venom so you need to allay the anxiety so uh, once the first step is done you you also take measures side by side to prevent any further absorption and for this you uh, the most uh, you know the scientifically proven technique is immobilization by uh, applying pressure immobilization uh, in some cases tonicoid application is allied, allowed other than that the techniques that are written in the book or that are given are not scientifically proven and they cause more harm than uh, uh, then benefit so they should be avoided uh, if the wound is filthy you can clean the wound using uh, plain water or saline no special solutions are recommended for cleaning the wound uh, immobilization as uh, we discussed is the only technique that is scientifically proven and this is again done with a lot of caution because this can also produce a lot of harmful effects so what you do is uh, Okay why you do it is because it decreases the once the the part that is bitten is immobilized there will be decreased lymphatic and circu uh, circulatory uh, spread of the venom and there will be decreased pain and you will ask the patient to not move that bitten part if it's the lower limb you will tell him to lie down on a stretcher and the per person should be moved on a stretcher and if this upper limb bitten it should be uh, packed in a sling Uh, other than that ice pack application or any such thing would rather cause more damage so it should be avoided uh, there is this pressure immobilization the, the authentic way of doing uh, is by applying a, a sutherland wrap in which you would and this is more uh, recommended for lapid bites because in cases of uh, viper bite it can cause local necrosis so it should be avoided in cases of viper bite For a lapid bite, you would use a compression bandage, uh, one that is elastic, like a crepe bandage, and not a tourniquet. And you should wrap it firmly, from uh, starting from the point of uh, bite, and you move upwards. So you'll maintain a pressure of 50 to 70 millimeter mercury, and this pressure can uh, would only occlude the lymphatic circulation, and the blood flow would not be impeded. So you should be able to palpate the pulses from this bandage. Uh, so just to check if there is uh, any compromise of the blood circulation so i've got a picture so this is how uh, sutherland wrap is done starting from the bite side you see the fang marks and this, the uh, pressure is up, the bandage is applied upwards and you can also put a um, a pipe or you know a stick to uh, to immobilize the joint as well so this is pressure immobilization use of tourniquet is not advised in uh, because of the the complication we will see and if a tourniquet is used it should be applied only when the person is bitten on a limb uh, it should be applied over a single bone and it should be tied 5 cm proximal to the bite side and only uh, it should be tied enough only to occlude the blood uh, venous blood and after every half hour it should be released for 1 minute so that no gangrene occurs and this should not be done more than 4 hours and this is again only done when the patient cannot reach the hospital at time and there is a delay in uh, taking the patient to the uh, healthcare facility so i was going through articles online and there was this article of a patient of a pediatric patient that was brought to the hospital with a tourniquet applied and you see uh, uh, because there are complications of uh, application of tourniquet as well so they started the patient on anti venom therapy first before removing the tourniquet and once they started the patient on anti venom therapy uh, they started removing the tourniquet or loosening the tourniquet gradually and uh, this helped in preventing the the consequences that can occur because of tourniquet application which are ischemia and gangrene they can be da danger to superficial peripheral nerves if it is very tight it can lead to uh, uh, 
both circulatory and nervous damage. There can be increased fibrinolytic activity in that occluded limb. Congestion and swelling uh, can occur as you see, uh, as you saw in the picture. And when the tonicoid is released, the there can be shock from that uh, occluded limb because of the sudden release of uh, venom into the circulation. Also, this can lead to intensification of the local effect of venom. So, the, once the patient was started on anti-venom infusion, the tonicoid was uh, then uh, removed gradually and this helped in uh, counteracting any any harmful side effects. The, some of the books say incision and suction can be done only if the patient uh, cannot be taken to a healthcare facility within the first 60 minutes and this again can lead to serious damage uh, serious uh, damage to the patient including disfigurement, hemorrhage, damage to nerves, damage to blood vessels and introduction of infection. Uh, also uh, it is to, uh, strictly avoided that, uh, that someone would suck the venom from the side using his mouth because if the person who is sucking the venom has uh, some injury in the mouth the chances are that the person will have uh, will develop snake poisoning himself uh, you know snake po uh, this venom if taken on intact uh, skin orally or uh, intact mucous membrane it cannot get absorbed it will be destroy destroyed in the stomach but if the person who is sucking the venom has a injury in the mouth somewhere uh, the snake venom can get absorbed from there and this can lead to toxic effects in that person as well so uh, so there was a book saying that if done within the first, first 30 minutes suction and uh, in, incision and suction can lead to 20% um, uh, of the venom can be removed from the body by this way but again it is strongly uh, you know prohibited it is not advised uh, so once you uh, started with a general uh, you started with a measures that can prevent the further absorption of poison. Now you also need to assess what is the severity of snake bite, whether the person is envenomated, whether there is mild injection of venom or there is moderate envenomation or severe envenomation. So I, I found this scale called the snake bite envenomation severity scale uh, in which you can, cat by using which you can categorize the severity of snake bite so it can be from no envenomation to severe envenomation and if a person has no envenomation or he is mildly injected by the venom uh, and you see the findings would be uh, in cases of no injection of venom there will be absence of local or systemic reactions and there will be fang marks uh, may be present or absent. In case of mild envenomation you see fang marks are present but there is minimal pain, mi minimal local swelling and this small area of erythema, the chymosis may be present but there is no systemic, uh, uh, there are no systemic symptoms. In these cases you can observe the patient for a while and uh, if there are no, if there is no worsening of condition the patient does not require the um, anti-snake venom. In cases of moderate envenomation and severe cases which I have, uh, the findings are given here you can see, you see some systemic symptoms, you will also see lab changes, the person uh, starts developing systemic weakness, nausea and vomiting, these are the systemic uh, effects. So you will have to start the patient on anti-snake venom therapy. So this would help in the uh, because you need to discriminate whether you need to give a patient snake venom, uh, anti-snake venom or not. Number one, because uh, it has a lot of hazardous effects and number two, because uh, anti-snake venom uh, uh, is a, you know, it's not very cheap so it should be used with, uh, in, pa in condition when the patient has moderate or severe envenomation. So another sign of uh, severe envenomation can be severe local en uh, symptoms that can be uh, swelling that involves more than half of the bitten limb or there is extensive blistering or bruising uh, or necrosis. So you will give the patient anti-snake venom therapy. Now there are two types of snake ven anti uh, venom and these are one are the specific ones the other are the polyvalent ones. The specific ones are made by hyperimmunizing horse against 
one particular type of snake and the polyvalent ones are made by hyperimmunizing horses against four common poisonous snakes in our setup these common snakes include cobra crate russell viper and saw scaled viper so if you are if there is a patient and you know for sure that the patient is bitten by a cobra you can use specific anti snake venom which is not commonly available in our setup otherwise if you're not sure which type of snake has bitten the person and you see that the, he's developing moderate or severe signs of envenomation you will start him with poly and uh, valent anti venom this will cover the these uh, four common poisonous snakes so this is specific anti venom and this is poly venom and you see it is available in the form of vials or ampoules and it is a dried uh, powder form so uh, the importance of anti snake venom uh, therapy is that in cases of snake bites the mortality overall is 40% but when you give adequate anti venom it reduces the mortality to less than 10% uh, even after delay if you are giving the patient anti snake venom therapy the chances are uh, that the mortality will be reduced uh, the person can develop some co uh, complications we'll see in detail later what are those complications that can be uh, Uh, serum sickness or anaphylactic reaction uh, so uh, we will see also how you formulate a uh, infusion from a snake venom uh, anti snake venom vial and uh, th this sna anti snake venom vial it it retains its potency for 10 years and uh, the contraindications to anti snake venom therapy are there are no absolute contraindications only in pa patients who have asthma or hay fever or eczema or food or drug li related allergies you 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 would presume that the person has a likely chance to react of reaction to anti snake venom so you will start free treatment with subcutaneous adrenaline and iv his anti histamines and corticosteroids now how you would uh, prepare the infusion from anti snake venom it is in the form of freeze dried lipophilized uh, uh vials that we saw uh, in the in a powder form and what you do is that you dissolve uh, this uh, one vial in 10 ml of normal saline or distilled water and you for for the initial dose you need at least 8 to 10 vials now in your book i think it is mentioned that you need to give the patient six vials or five vials so uh, so there is a variation in some uh, by some authors so when you give five vial let's say you will be formulating 50 ml of serum because to each vial you will be adding 10 ml of uh, distilled water or normal saline and when you are using 8 to 10 vials it would be 80 to 100 ml of serum so once you form this serum you have to dilute it now you cannot give it directly you have to dilute it and you have to give it slowly in an iv infusion form so for that you need uh, isotonic saline 200 to 500 ml in some books it is given 1 liter of isotonic saline you'll add this 80 ml of serum or 50 ml as per your book into that isotonic saline and then you'll make a uh and you'll have this uh, infusion for slow iv and this you will give over a period of 1 hour so it, once you've completed it you need to reassess the patient whether the symptoms are still there or they have disappeared if the symptoms persist you need to start the infusion again for uh, elapis it is recommended that after every 1 hour you check the patient and if it if require uh, the patient requires you give infusion again for a for a maximum dose of up to 30 vials for uh, vipers they say that you can check after every 6 hours whether the patient needs uh, repeat dose or not but you need to check uh, say, uh, to be on the safe side you need to check after uh, every 1 hour whether the patient needs further treatment or not by anti venom now these are the reactions that can occur uh, due to hypersensitivity to anti venom it can be uh, a type 1 immediate reaction that is the anaphylactic reaction which is manifested by itching urticaria glottic edema wheezing cough nausea vomiting fever and tachycardia or there can be a delayed type 
uh, type of hypersensitivity which is also known as serum sickness now if there is anaphylactic or type 1 type of hypersensitivity this will not be dose related it is not related to how much anti snake venom you gave or you know uh, if you've given a large dose or a, or a small dose it is a type 1 reaction so it can occur even on small doses so once it develops once you see that the patient's developing a uh, type 1 reaction you need to start him on adrenaline subcutaneously i've uh, mentioned both the adult and uh, children doses here and uh, this will cover the uh, the hypersensitivity also you give the uh, antihistamines and steroids to cover the hypersensitivity for serum sickness or type 3 type uh, hypersensitivity this is dose related actually and this occurs delayed this uh, this can take 3 days to 3 weeks to develop the symptoms are fever urticaria and lymphadenopathy and arthritis and this only occurs when you give a lot of anti serum so uh, if the patient develops in hypersensitivity you will need to treat him accordingly now we come to the supportive treatment. The supportive treatment includes general measures which are also important. For example, if the per person is having difficulty breathing, you'll give artificial respiration. You, you'll be needing antibiotics for prophylaxis against infection. You'll give, uh, in cases of the patient's developing shock, you can give him uh, steroids. You'll also give him dopamine and uh, uh, fluids. The antihistamine should be given in cases when the patient is developing hypersensitivity and if the patient is going in acute renal failure which is uh, seen in viper bite you will you'll need to do hemodialysis so if uh, the patient they are again related to the type of snake if the patient is bitten by a viper uh, the, there may there will be coagulation abnormalities and for that you need to uh, if the patient uh, the coagulation abnormalities are not corrected by antivenom therapy you need to administer fresh whole blood or fresh uh, frozen plasma or cryo precipitate so you need to cover the uh, so that uh, the circulatory or the vesculotoxic uh, symptoms by these uh, by these treatments and if the patient's going into shock you you give him vasopressors like dopamine if the patient has developed neurotoxicity uh, Remember, we did organophosphorus uh, uh, insecticide, so the treatment is uh, similar. You'll give atropine to cover the uh, muscarinic effects that are produced by anticholinesterase uh, uh, cholinesterase, uh, uh, enzyme, and this will prevent the undesirable effect of muscarinic, uh, uh, muscarinic effects of acetylcholine. Also, you can give an in injection of neostigmine or atrophonium chloride and uh, so this is the treatment of neurotoxicity i've mentioned the doses uh, so this is a flow chart this summarizes how you will treat a patient of snake bite it can be a dry bite or minimal envenomation or it can be moderate to severe so if it's dry bite or mild uh, symptoms are there you'll observe the patient for 8 to 12 hours and if there's no progression of symptoms no antivenom is required if there's moderate to severe envenomation, you'll see local edema, ekymosis, or you'll see new local, local symptoms along with systemic effects. So you need to immobilize uh, or apply pressure immobilization, and then you start the patient on antivenom. So one, if the patient has uh, only local symptoms and there are no systemic symptoms, severe local symptoms are present, you only need to give initial dose of antivenom and uh, uh, see if dialysis or blood transfusion is required but if the patient has neuroparalysis you need to give initial dose of antivenom and you may ne need to uh, put the patient on uh, artificial respiration and atropine and neostigmine are required so this is basically the lapid bite and this is the uh, vesculotoxic or viper bite so you see the patient observe the patient for envenomation progression and if there's no progression no further treatment is required only the initial dose that we discussed 8 to 10 vials or uh, 5 to 6 vials as per your book is uh, given or you, uh, if there's progression of symptoms you'll need to repeat as we discussed you'll observe and repeat the dose so the medical legal importance of snake bite is that most commonly the uh, people are bitten accidentally really uh, it, it uh, snakes are used for suicide and there's this famous uh, 
incidents of queen cleopatra who committed suicide by a snake venom also it is it, it is used as a cattle poison uh for killing cattle snake poison is used in the past snake poison was used for war, war weapons but not nowadays occasionally p- people throw snakes on other people who are sleeping to cause uh, murder so homicidal can be a rare incident suicide is again very rare it is most commonly accidental so this 